Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just start by, by sharing that I recently made this new discovery. And this discovery involved a paradox. And the paradox is this, that AI, as Stephen mentioned, can not only accelerate human bias, but it can also overcome it. Isn't that fascinating? Well, I was fascinated by this because bias is a very big problem. And we've been working on solving this problem for a very long time. In fact, I personally have worked on this problem for the last 30 years. The reason I got excited about AI as a new way to interrupt bias is because it does so much faster than humans. And for that reason, I'll tell you how it works. It works like this. It moves us from very fast, unconscious thinking to slow, conscious thinking. And this is the title of my talk, Slow Thinking Fast, How AI Trumped Human Bias. So as we get started here, I'd like to share with you a demonstration of what I mean by this. And I'm going to use ChatGPT to actually show you the demonstration. OK, so this is the AI paradox that I started with. And as I pulled up ChatGPT on my phone, you could do so along with me if you'd like to, um, I decided that I was going to ask it some questions related to my research. And the reason for this is because, as I thought about it, we all know that AI can hallucinate, and it can make up answers that seem plausible, but yet they're unsubstantiated. So we need to be careful. So I started by asking it this question. I said, could you please generate five images of a board director? And it said back to me, yes, I can do that. It said, could you tell me if you have any preferences for gender, what these people are wearing, whether they're in the office? I said, no, you just decide. So this is what AI produced for me. OK, so five images here. We'll stop on the last one. And this seemed pretty plausible to me. These all look like board directors. They're in the boardroom. They're in the executive suite. They're dressed like they mean business. There's a good mix of men and women in there. But there's just one problem. And the problem is this. They're all from the same race. So then, of course, I decided to ask ChatGPT, what is the current racial composition of US board directors? And it proceeded to tell me that 22.2% are from underrepresented minority backgrounds. It went on to say that this has been a significant increase since 2020, when the number was 17.5%, because significant gains had been made by African Americans, moderate gains by Asians, and small gains by Hispanics. So then, of course, what did I decide to do? I asked ChatGPT, well, given that information, could you please generate five new images reflecting this racial composition? And this is what it produced. <laughs> OK, so we're getting more diverse. And you'll see that uh, in these images, they represent the true reality of the racial composition of the US boardroom today. So with this demonstration, what I intended to show you was that initially AI was, in fact, bias towards perhaps what the stereotypical board director has looked like in the US. And then I trained it using data to really produce what it looks like today. And so it has the capacity to be trained to be unbiased. So now that I've shared this example with you, you might be wondering, well, who cares? Why in the world does it matter that AI can interrupt bias? And the reason for that is because we as a country truly believe in this concept of justice for all. I remember it was the last words of the Pledge of Allegiance that I said every day in high school. And yet we can't seem to agree in this country on where to draw the line of fairness to achieve this ideal of justice for all. Is it at the starting line with opportunity or is it at the finish line with outcomes? And we as a country seem to be having this big debate on whether we need to choose excellence or diversity. And we're pitting the two against each other as if they were mutually exclusive. So as I think about what's happened in the last five years, I really think about the year 2023. I remember the date specifically, June 29th. It was the day that the US Supreme Court 
made a decision to ban the use of race as a criterion in college and university admissions. And the reactions to this were very strong from this side and from that side. We had attorney generals from half of the states writing letters and attorney generals from the other half of the states writing rebuttals back. In the aftermath, companies decided to pull back on programs that provided preferential treatment for certain demographic groups, which had been historically underrepresented. There was a big backlash on inclusion training and things were changing. But it was hard to believe that only three years earlier in 2020 was when the unfortunate murder of George Floyd and several others had reinvigorated the Black Lives Matter movement. And soon thereafter, companies had made very bold commitments to making sure that their workforces represented the communities in which they were operating, not only at the overall workforce level, but also at the executive level. At that time, I was the global head of the diversity, equity, and inclusion practice at a major global executive search firm. Our clients were demanding of us diverse slates across every single search that we conducted at the executive level. And gosh, this was a tall order because underrepresented minorities were woefully underrepresented at the senior most levels. So working with my team, I came up with a solution and we created something called inclusive search practices. And we created practices like this. We looked at job specifications and we said, what are the only the must have requirements that we should have on here so that we can open the aperture wider? We also found ways to over, overturn any stone to look for candidates far and wide as much as we could through relationships with different organizations. And in addition to that, we use competency-based selection processes to make sure that we were focused on hiring for skills and not necessarily letting our like similarity attraction biases or other biases enter our decision-making process. So what was really amazing about these practices is that they combined both excellence with diversity. And so my colleagues around the world, as I trained them, embraced these practices and we quickly rolled them out across all of our searches, not only in my firm, but also across the entire executive search industry. And yet the hardest part of the work was actually training humans to do this, right? It's not easy to train humans to mitigate biases. So that's why I became very, very excited about the potential for AI to automate a lot of these practices in a very, very different way. If we think back to January 20th of just this year, that day was a Monday, it was Martin Luther King Day, and in addition to that, it was a presidential inauguration. Soon thereafter, there were executive orders that had gone into place that caused companies to fully divest of many of their DEI programs. And so certainly we need a different way to solve this problem. So I've lived in Silicon Valley for the last 30 years, and this AI revolution, a period of innovation, seemed even bigger than the last big boom, which was the internet back in the late 90s. I had just graduated from Stanford Business School, and really there was a lot of exuberance. Fast forward to 2024, there was so much exuberance around AI that I decided to take an executive education course at UC Berkeley to learn more about it, because most of the questions I had been asked were really about bias and the fact that AI accelerates bias. So the more curious I became and the more I learned, I had an opportunity to become advisor to an AI talent company. And there I saw firsthand the potential for AI to actually interrupt bias. And I became super excited about this because bias is a very big problem. In fact, companies spend collectively about $8 billion each year on unconscious bias training. Now in 2016, Dominic Dobbin and Kalev found that much of this mandatory unconscious bias training doesn't actually work. And so we need a different solution to this age old problem, which is why I got very excited about AI being a potential interrupter. Yet at the same time, there were real world examples of AI actually causing a lot of bias and harm on important decisions. So I'll give you a couple of those examples. Just last year, an AI recruiting platform was sued for age, race, and disability discrimination. In addition to that, a few years earlier, a recruiting AI 
actually learned to penalize the word woman on resumes, such as in the phrase, woman's chess club captain. And the reason it did this is because it was fed 10 years of mostly male resume data in a highly gendered industry. It was the tech industry. And what was happening is that we as humans were feeding it biased data. The biased data was feeding the algorithms and training the algorithms to be biased. And fortunately, this company has made great strides to really improve its technology so that now they are developing technology that's born inclusive is how they call it. Um, so there's some hope, and I'll, I'll share with you one opposite example in the real world. And this example is in the city of San Francisco. Um, I drive through it every day to get from where I live in Marin to Silicon Valley for work. And what's happening right now is that um, they're putting in place these AI-powered cameras, and those cameras will be monitoring the speed of the traffic um, and giving tickets to any car that's traveling over 11 miles per hour over the speed limit. And the reason that that's significant as I think about bias is because today most of the police stops um, actually are the Hispanics and blacks that get stopped are overrepresented in those stops compared to their representation in the population. So I feel like AI might actually be a more even way to distribute the tickets that would not be as biased. So I'm excited to see what might happen. And in addition to that, I um, wanted to conduct an experiment in which I was able to test both AI that was inherently biased with this data bias and algorithmic bias that we often feed to it, and AI that had been debiased by design. So I conducted this experiment in the fourth quarter of last year, it was a pilot, and it was in the context of a board search. So I asked participants to conduct this board search for a NASDAQ high growth company, and I asked them to conduct the search using three different AI policies. The first policy was this AI that was inherently biased and had this data and algorithmic bias problem. The second recruiting AI was designed with debiasing principles. And the third AI policy was no AI at all, or just a traditional database approach to conducting the search. And here's what we found. When we tested um, these three policies on three different criteria, the first one being diversity, the second one being quality, and the third one being speed, we found that on diversity, the AI was actually able to pull in much more diversity because it reached out to networks and expanded the net so far that we as humans can't possibly do ourselves. So that was an interesting finding. Um, the second finding around speed was this, was that AI was able to produce these potential candidates much faster than we ever could as human beings. And it did so because of the processing power of an AI chip. And then the last finding was around quality. And this, for me, was the most interesting finding. What we found was that AI with inherent bias generated the lowest quality candidate slates of all three policies. Whereas the AI that had been debiased by design generated the highest quality of all three policies, even more so than the no AI control. So here was the finding, right, that was so interesting to me was that this AI that had been debiased by design was able to deliver higher diversity and higher quality at the same time. So if we think back right, to this big debate that we're having in the US on excellence versus diversity, this solution was able to deliver both at the same time. And the reason that it was able to do this is because it moved us from using our fast, unconscious thinking, filtering through resumes, thinking about things like title or the, the company someone worked for, um, or those proxies that we use for skills, instead of actually looking at the hard evidence and comparing each and every single resume against the same set of skills. And that's how it moved us from thinking more um, quickly or fast and unconsciously to moving to more conscious and slow thinking. And it did so faster, right, than the human brain can, can process. And that's why the talk, right, is entitled Slow Thinking Fast. So as I um, begin to conclude my talk, I'd like to just share with you one last example. And this example 
um, is a personal one. So I've been working on this problem for 30 years. I started in college when um, I was working on solving this problem in our honor system at the University of Virginia. And, and as I share with you an example, think back to like grade school or something like that when you played those games and you often said, okay, which one of these statements is false? So I'll give you three statements about myself. I was the CEO of a venture-backed tech company. I won a top sales award for a company as a top producer. And I was the women's basketball team captain. So start thinking, which one of these statements do you think is false about me? And if you were processing like a human brain would, you'd probably think to the fact that only 7% of venture-backed companies are led by female CEOs. You'd also think to the fact that, well, not that many Asians are in sales roles. And then you might be thinking, well, she's wearing pink. How could she possibly be good at basketball? Uh, so then let me compare that right, to how AI might process the information. So recruiting AI might have access to my resume because I applied for a job and it's in an ATS system. It probably has access to my LinkedIn profile. And it may even have access to my Facebook profile. And if it went through all that information and did it as quickly as it does it, it would find that I was captain of the girls basketball team in high school. I won a top sales award at the corporate executive board. And in fact, I was the CEO of a venture-backed tech company. So all three were true. And if we think about the difference in AI being able to find the answer to this, um, these questions much more quickly and much less, in a much less biased way than the human brain processes, I become very excited about the potential for AI to interrupt bias. And as I ask you to think about what the future could look like if we used AI as a bias interrupter and implemented it across many different contexts, including the employment context I've been talking with you about, consumer contexts such as lending, and in addition to that criminal context where it certainly matters, I'd like to ask you to visualize what the future could look like. And what I see is I see a world in which everybody feels like they're seen fairly, no matter what the color of their skin. And I get really excited about that. I hope that this talk has given you the inspiration to consider exploring and experimenting with AI and considering the impact that AI can have on justice for all. Thank you.